Welcome everybody. I'd like to call the 1,224th meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington to order uh, tonight, December 2nd, 2021. This is our once a year annual meeting, which is the final meeting of the regular session for 2021. And it will include um, a summary of the society's activities for the year, which I'll, I will give, and also election of new officers. Please know that the, uh, this meeting will be recorded and posted on our, our YouTube channel. So if you want to remain completely anony anonymous, just don't share your video and your name won't appear on the recording either. Okay. Uh, first off, do we have Gary Hevel out there, our recording secretary? Yes. Hi, Gary. Please go ahead and, and uh, read the, the minutes of our last meeting. Okay. <clears throat> the 1223rd regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington is called to order at 7 p.m. on the 4th of November, 2021, by President-elect Lourdes Chamorro, in place of President Jamie Zonheiser, who was not available. As in the recent past, the meeting was virtual with 41 members and guests in attendance. Recording Secretary Gary Hevel read the minutes of the October meeting, and these were approved. Membership and Communications Secretary Elizabeth Young reported that there were no new membership applications, and then read the names of applicants first presented in the October meeting. Jay Abercrombie, Brian Gilbert, Jeff Webb, Raphael Colorado, Alexander Orfinger, Brandon Randall, and Attilano, Attilano Contreras Ramos. These applicants are now official members of the society. President-elect Chamorro reported that the nominating committee for officers in 2022 have nearly finished their business and there should be an internet message with such information before the December meeting. Program Chair Alan Norbaum introduced the speaker of the evening, Dr. Julie Urban from Penn State, whose presentation was titled Spotted Lanternfly, Updates on, Update on Impact Management and Research. Dr. Urban noted that the Spotted Lanternfly first appeared in Pennsylvania in September of 2014. Within two weeks, an action group was organized with members from Penn State and the USDA. It was likely that the NF, rather SLF invaders entered the United States from China on stones. Individuals of this species are known to feed on one, some 100 plant species, preferring Alanthus trees. The research group engaged in precise surveys, evaluated insecticide control, and studied life cycles of the pest. Spotted lanternflies are a formidable enemy that continue to broaden their distribution in the Northeast United States. The meeting was adjourned at 8.30 p.m. Okay, thank you, Gary. Do we have any additions or amendments to, to the notes? Okay, do we have a motion to approve the notes as read? So moved. A second. second. The, the minutes are approved. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Okay, do we have membership and communication secretary Elizabeth Young on the line? Hello, yes, you do. Hey, Elizabeth. Hi there. Um, so we have six new members to report uh, this month. Their names are Alexander Go Gonzalez Halgren, Dr. P.R. Shawshank, Alan H. Smith Pardo, Jaria Okayazu, Naeem Hook, and Dr. Sue Vixen. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Very happy to hear that uh, we've got more new members. Um, okay, the next section is um, the presentation of the, the, the president's summary of the year's activities. So that's me. I'm a, I'll beg your um, 
forgiveness if this is too long, but we'll give it a shot. I'll try to get through it quickly. Okay, the state of the society is what I'm calling the new normal. Uh, past President Cheryl O'Donnell reported last year that the state of the society was evolving as the COVID-19 pandemic up and up upended all of our lives and certainly affected our society. The in-person member meetings were, that were planned for April and May of 2020 and the annual banquet were canceled due to building and public gathering restrictions. Huh? Under, uh, under the leadership of President O'Donnell, we regrouped in the fall and resumed member meetings online over Zoom. Despite the in inherent shortcomings of online meetings that all of us have experienced over the, over the two years, I think uh, everybody in our society would agree that we saw many benefits to, the, to this online format. Foremost is that our monthly member meetings are now accessible to all members of um, our society, not only those living in the DC area as they were in, when we had our in-person meetings. The increased uh, member and public attendance at our at our meetings has been fantastic, and I'm happy to say that we plan to continue broadcasting member meetings online even after, after we return to in-person meetings. Whenever that is, we're not sure when that will be. The online format has also allowed, allowed us to reach out to entomologists across the country to provide scientific talks, and has resulted in some excellent presentations and well-attended meetings. Finally, the online format has created the opportunity to, to record and post the entirety, entirety of each meeting on our recently established YouTube channel. Um, it's called Ent, Ent Sock Wash DC channel. Um, and you can see all the um, posted meetings and presentations since we started um, on that channel. Now everyone in our society and the public at large will have the chance uh, to watch a meeting that they missed or to share with, uh, with others that may be interested. Well, I think we have uh, found our way to a new, a new normal. The pandemic is obviously still not over and we still face building restrictions and are not able to meet in person. Thus, we will continually need to be flexible and, and, uh, and evolve to meet the new circumstances that await. Um, personally, I feel very honored to uh, have served as president of the society with its long, rich history and uh, curious and active community. I'm, I'm very grateful to all the members of the executive co committee for their hard work de uh, dedicated to keeping the society functioning well. I look forward to continuing engagement with the society serving uh, as ESW, serving on the ESW executive committee as past president in 2022 and as subject editor, editor for the Proceedings of Entomological Society of Washington. I'm happy to uh, later this evening pass the gavel over to uh, the able hands of our incoming president, uh, Dr. Lourdes, Lourdes Tremoro, and I'm excited to see where this next year will take us. Okay, so that's just the introduction. Now I'm going to go over the year's activities. Uh, our first meeting of uh, 2021 was held on January 7th, uh, just one day after the disturbing up upheaval at our Capitol building. Ultimately, I was happy to, to report that all of our members, many of whom live in the DC area, were safe and that there was no damage to the National Museum of Natural History where our in-person meetings are normally held. Despite the tumultuous beginning of the year, we carried on. Uh, Program Chair Alan Norbaum compiled a stellar list of guest speakers for 2021, and I'm very grateful for, for his work. As is customary in our society, the past president provides the first talk of uh, scientific talk of the year. And in January, uh, uh, past president Cheryl O'Donnell delivered an engaging talk on uh, thrips found on Christmas trees. In February, February Dan Rubinoff uh, detailed the amazing discoveries he and his team are making on the radiation of case caterpillars in the Wayanara Islands. In March, Elaine Hippie and Andrew Forbes teamed up for a talk on uh, Straussia sunflower maggot flies. In, in April, Chris Simon gave a talk on 17 year uh, periodical cicadas, which was a very timely talk in anticipation of the emergence of brood 10. 
um, the largest of the 17 year cicada brews, which also encompasses the DC area. And the brew itself did not disappoint. Um, Chris, Chris's talk is distinguished as our most viewed on YouTube, having to date been watched over 830 times. Uh, so that's another kind of amazing endorsement of the online format and extended reach that would not have been possible without it. In May, Mark Branham gave a fascinating talk about the evolution of, the, of bioluminescence in fireflies. And, uh, and after the summer recess, we returned in October and uh, Ikito Kawahara provided an amazing pre presentation on the evolution of butterflies and moss in relation to depredation from bats and their sonic interactions. In November, Julie Urban updated us, updated us on the status of spotted lanternfly invasion in the United States, uh, its biology and ecology, and the coordinated effort to stop its spread and reduce its impact on agriculture. And tonight, I'm very excited to hear our final talk of the 2021 regular session tonight from Dr. Jessica Ware on the evolution of dragonflies. President-elect Lourdes Chamorro organized the, the annual banquet this year, which saw its successful return after having been canceled the previous year due to, due to COVID restrictions. The banquet is normally held in June, but this year was rescheduled again due to the uh, pandemic for September 9th um, of, of this past year. The banquet was held at Wood End Nature Sanctuary and the invited speaker, uh, Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware provided an inspiring and informative talk entitled, A Guide to, the, to Restoring the Little Things That Run the World. Uh, to an audience of approximately 25 people at the venue, and more than 70 participants online over Zoom. Lourdes also assembled, uh, this past year, Lourdes also assembled the nominating committee, which uh, included Paul Goldstein as chair, uh, Stuart McCamey, and Floyd Shockley. And she also organized the auditing committee, which included uh, Jungwook Kim, Woogie, uh, as he's known, uh, to all of us, uh, Tom Henry and Ben Proshek. Um, so, um, thank you to Lourdes for, um, for your services here, and I look forward to working with you in the coming year. Uh, all members of the, of our society and authors, uh, excuse me, all members of our society and authors of papers in our journal, the Proceedings of the Entomological Society of Washington, should be uh, very grateful to the dedication and work of our editor, uh, Mark Metz. It was a particularly particularly challenging year as editor due to internal changes in our printing and distribution company, company uh, Knowledge Works Global. Uh, once again, the pandemic saw its impact and caused a delay of issue three of the proceedings, which is normally scheduled for July, but is not published until October. But due in large part to Mark's persistence and hard work in working with the, the publisher, the issue was published. And the publication schedule aims to be on track by issue two of next year. Issues one through three of, of this year's volume, which is volume 123, um, totaled an impressive 692 pages. This is not quite as many as last year's possibly record year, but well above the 10 year average. These three issues comprised 40 research articles, 14 notes, one book review, one in memoriam, which all of which documented six new genera, 22 new species, seven new synonymies, and six new combinations. Thanks very much, Mark, for your hard work. So although, although the audit, auditing committee has not had the chance to perform their review of the finances yet, uh, yeah, Treasurer yeah. Abby, Abigail Kula reported, reported to me a net increase of $14,695 in, in our budget, bringing our um, total asset balance to $143,205. In addition, in addition to handling the financial tra transactions for the society and uh, coordinating with the membership and communication secretary on membership and applications fee, Abby continued to work on an initiative that was begun in 
2019 that will enable our society to make investments of its savings. Abby is working to acquire legal documents that uh, will make this possible. And so on behalf of all of us, I thank you, Abby, for your hard work as treasurer for the society. Uh, membership and communication secretary, uh, secretary Elizabeth Young completed a successful first year in, in this position. Elizabeth reports that the number of institutional sus subscribers declined uh, from 44 in 2019, which is the last year that we had a submitted report, uh, to 32 institutional subscribers this year. However, the number of active personal membership rose from 204 in 2019 to 236 this year. There were 26 new personal members added in, in 2021. Elizabeth also managed our budding uh, social media pre presence by sending out member meeting announcements on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your work. Uh, I wish to send my, thank send my thanks to the other members of the, the executive committee. Uh, Cheryl O'Donnell served as past president. I'm very thankful for her service and advice, advice throughout the year. Gary Hevel continued his longstanding post as recording secretary and consistently delivered detailed and accurate notes for, for each meeting. And our cur curator, Nick Silverson, helped to track our reserve stock of publications and has made plans to reorganize the physical holdings of publications in the entomology, entomology library at the Museum of Natural History. I would like to give a special thanks to Cecilia Escobar, who provided crucial technical advice and support for our online Zoom meetings and created and maintains our YouTube channel. David Damsky had an active year with the, with the Young Entomologist Group. The group had six virtual meetings and presentations, two masked indoor presentations, uh, the Young Entomologist Group recognitions meeting featuring Ron Ochoa as the keynote, keynote speaker with a presentation entitled Mites, a study of biodiversity and adaptation. And also they hosted six outdoor programs. The Young Entomologist Group will begin its 11th year in February, 2022. Congratulations, Dave, on continuing to encourage a new generation of entomologists. So in, in addition to the activities highlighted above, the executive committee met monthly to just discuss the functioning of the society and worked on special initiatives. The committee approved a special issue of the proceedings to be published in 2022. Details about this will come out later. The committee also aligned some aspects of the society's online presence and archive documents by establishing, establishing dedicated Google accounts for uh, and email addresses for each officer and office, officer accounts are now, um, now share documents from the work of society from previous years. And so this will provide more continuity and, and help future executive committees for years to come. I would like to thank all the members of this executive committee for the valuable input, input throughout the year. I'd like to thank all the members of the society for your active participation in, in our meetings. And I look forward to continuing to serve as uh, on the committee uh, in the coming year as past president for 2022. Okay, hope that was not too long. Okay, uh, thanks for indulging me and it's been a fun year. So I, I have really enjoyed it. Um, it's been a, a good learning experience for me. Good to meet a whole bunch of you. Um, so thanks. Okay, where are we now? Okay, fun time, election of new officers. This will be perhaps a little bit challenging because of the online format, um, but uh, I, think, I think we'll make it through. Okay, so first I'll just start by um, giving the um, the nominees that were uh, that that have been submitted by the nominating committee uh, for elected officers in 20, 2022. Essentially, all the standing officers um, agreed to um, uh, continue their their positions, 
And so we none of the positions are contested. Um, but so here here are the nominees. Um, the the one new one will, will be um, President Elect Matt Buffington. Uh, program chair is Alan Norbaum. Curator is Nick Silverson. Recording secretary Gary Hevel. Membership and communication secretary Elizabeth Young. Treasurer Abigail Kula and editor Mark Metz. Uh, so we, uh, I think it's traditional that we now ask if there are any last minute nominations that anybody would like to make. Okay, I don't think there are, usually there are not. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna vote on the entire slate of nominees. Um, so to do this over Zoom, I think what I'm gonna do is first say, for, uh, first you have to be an active member to, to have a vote. Each, each active member has one vote. Um, so um, I'll first ask for um, votes for approving the entire list. If so, we're not doing it right now, but you'll raise your hand, or if you're not sharing your screen, you, you can unmute and say aye. Um, and then I'll ask um, um, well, I, then I'll, then I'll ask if uh, for all those uh, opposed to attending nominees or to the entire slate to again begin either raise your hand or say nay. Okay, so let's give this a shot. Okay, so all those approved of the entire slate of nominees for 2022 as read, please raise your hand or say aye. 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 Okay, great. I heard a number of eyes. I see a number of hands. I see a number of virtual hands. Okay, so we've got a, kind of a, a look at what we got there. Okay, now I'll ask for the nays. So if, if you still got your hand, virtual hand up, please, please lower it. Uh, do we have anybody opposed to, to any of the nominees or the entire slate of the nominees? Uh, if so, please raise your hand or say nay. Okay, having no nays and all ayes approved. Um, uh, I think the majority has uh, approved the, this, our slate of nominees for, for 2022, very happy. Do we have a motion to approve the slate of nominees? Would anybody like to motion? Okay, I heard a motion. How about a second? A second. It's seconded <laughs> and the slate of nominees is approved. Thank Yay. you. Yeah. These rules of the society, I'll tell you what, we made it through. Um, okay, so. We've got a whole new list of officers. At the at the end of the meeting, we'll actually have um, the uh, passing of the gavel, where um, Lourdes will will um, take over as president, and she'll she'll end up closing the, the meeting. But we just have a couple more orders of business. One is any un, uh, unfinished business. Do we have anybody that has unfinished business they'd like to talk about? New business. I have one item, but. If you have new business, please go forth. Okay, my one order, my one item of new business is please renew your membership. Um, so the there uh, the Google form uh, that's linked on our website uh, on the member site um, is available for for you to click on. That's the only way to to renew your membership. You can pay online um, over PayPal or by check. Uh, membership is thirty dollars per year. That includes a um, an online subscription to the proceedings and also free page charges to publish in the proceedings, including two free color plates. And if you wish to uh, receive hard copies of the proceedings, which is published four times per year, it's an extra thirty dollars. So it would be sixty dollars. 
And we also have a good deal for student members. So uh, member dues are just $15 per year for to get the online subscription and $30 per year if you want the hard copy subscription. So please don't forget to do that. Okay, next section of the meeting. Uh, Presenting, yes. Um, there, there's a few questions on the chat and, and uh, that we may want to address. Okay. So one is from Ben Proshek about renewal reminder email, if it has been sent. Uh, it has been sent out yet, but I uh, was working out something with Abby just to make sure that the forms are ready to go. Uh, we're having a slight issue with PayPal at the moment. Um, just it needs to be updated for 2022. Uh, and once that's ready, uh, probably in the next day or so, you should be getting all members should be getting a renewal reminder in the next uh, couple of days or so. Okay, sounds good. Incidentally, just to try it out, I, re I renewed my membership today and um, I paid over PayPal. I, I didn't seem to have a problem. I think it took my money. So um, that's great. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, we'll look for um, the the email announcement. Thank you. And just just a quick little thing. Usually we have visitors introduce themselves, and I think we forgot about that. You're right. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Yes. Are, are there any uh, visitors um, tonight that would like to introduce themselves? Sure, I can jump in there. Uh, okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Carr. Uh, I've been a member since 2019, at least that's when I started paying my dues. Uh, this is actually the first meeting I've gotten to sit in on, just because typically time of the week and that sort of thing is a little hard to get a uh, jump on board with, but I just graduated with my undergraduate at George Mason, and I'm doing some independent research on the giant stag beetle here in Virginia, and we'll hopefully get to advance a little bit more towards that in the coming years. Very cool. Welcome. Thanks. Awesome. Um, I'm Tyna Litwack. I'm not a member, but I show up every once in a while because I'm the staff illustrator in uh, at the Systematic Entomology. So I work with Lourdes and Matt and Paul Goldstein. And I am Ross Garrison, and my interest is in Odonata, as Jessica Ware knows. I think we actually co-authored a paper together. Anyway, I'm retired, so I don't have to do a, any job. All I'm doing is really is working on uh, damselflies of the genus Argia right now. So with my wife, Natalia, who is still at work and will be coming home. So great to be here. Great. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. I might as well uh, chime in. I'm Hal White. I'm in uh, Delaware and my interest is also in dragonflies, and it's good to see Rosser. I haven't seen him for a long time, and it's good to see Jessica as well. So, good to see you all. Great, thank you. It's great to see so many Odinate workers. Mm. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks for the reminder, Lourdes. You're totally right. I totally forgot about that. Um, okay. Next section will be presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. Does anybody have a specimen? Matt does, okay. Well, it's not, it's not a specimen, but it's a book that I'm super excited about called To Make a Spotless Orange. And it's the history of the biological control program at the University of California, Riverside and the early citrus industry in Southern California from about 1880 on to about uh, the breakout of World War II. And as my alma mater and my fascination in all things scientific history and all the bizarre characters involved in the taxonomy of Microhymenoptera, this book explains a lot. And it's actually a dissertation by a fellow that was there while I was there. We never met, he was in history. 
Um, but it's a fantastic book and I won't loan you my copy because it took me about nine years to find one. So, but I'll send you the title and ISBN number. So you too can start your nine year study of trying to find one if you're so interested. Very cool, um, thank you, Matt. I have, a, I have a couple books to mention. Um, one I'm holding up, The Kissing Bug. Uh, it's actually, I believe it's on some kind of bestseller list. I just reviewed it for American entomologists. Um, and if you um, want to see, want a uh, PDF of that, just um, put it in the group chat, I'll send it to you. But that'll be out in the next American entomologist site. I recommend it highly. It's, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of social background in terms of the, um, the, the uh, Chagas disease that the um, kissing bug vectors, very interesting. Um, and the second one I wanna show just came out. Um, it's a very um, large edited compendium by Peter Mason of Ag Canada on biological control. And um, a number of us um, have chapters in there. It's a very comprehensive treatment. Um, and it's uh, CSIRO and CRC, I think are um, robbing us to pay. But it's one of those examples where it's about 600 pages long and it's very comprehensive and it's, it's probably worth the price, which I can't recall. Can you, Matt? It's like two hundred twenty dollars or something. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's um, it's it's definitely one of those technical books, but um, yeah, I think the is it available as an ebook? It is available as an ebook, um, and um, I think if you, I at this point, I I I don't know whether it's on Amazon yet, but um, Peter Mason and Biological Control will probably locate it for you pretty easily. I would uh, also like to show this book too, which was written by my friend, John Tennant. It's called The Man Who Shot Butterflies. I guess that's reversed on this one. Anyway, it's a self-published book on the, the biography of one of Lord Rothschild's collectors, Alfred S. Meek, who collected uh, mainly in New Guinea and the islands uh, surrounding that area. Um, this book was published in a limited edition of uh, about 500 copies and it's available for about $150, I guess. On the back here, it's got one of the, the birds on. It's a very beautiful work. I've, I've uh, been reading it and it's quite interesting. Uh, Meek wrote a book, actually, I, it was sort of uh, on, called A Naturalist in Cannibal Land, which details his adventures in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s on specimens for the Tring Museum. But anybody interested in collectors per se or some of the natural history people who were involved in the uh, early 20th century and late 19th century, it's a book to get. Uh, quite, a, quite readable and well-researched. I have actually have a book too. I don't know if you guys, if, if stop me if you've already had somebody speak about this book it, to the group. This is The Mosquitoes of the World. Nobody talked about this earlier. Oh no, it, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, well, it, it's a two volume set. It's, it's massive. It's a catalog of all the mosquitoes of the world. Yvonne Linton, Richard Wilkerson and Dan Strickman did it. Rick, Rich, Rick is the first author. Dr. Wilkerson's retired now, but he was with Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, uh, the systematic, the entomology lab there for a long, long time. Um, and Dan Strickman was there for a while, and then he was the Bill Gates's mosquito malaria czar for a while after a stint with the USDA. And he unfortunately didn't live to see the book published. Um, but it came out, and it's a couple hundred dollars. But it's this is the entire catalog, and it has um, 833 photographs and 583 illustrations. When I say illustrations, a lot of them are full plates. So it's massively illustrated and um, it's worth the money. It's really a good book, I think. <laughs> and I did the layout and did the photo research and stuff. 
I'd like to share a couple of books um, that just came into my possession. Um, Silent Earth um, by Dave Goulson, which is a very wonderful and depressing read <laughs> about the decline of insect populations. Uh, there is information at the end of things we can do individually and on a political uh, level to try and at least slow things down in our immediate areas, but it's, it's well worth a read. And especially those of you that are teaching uh, at any level, uh, these are uh, talking points that would be very useful in any coursework. And another book that I just received, um, Pollinators, Predators, and Parasites. And uh, this is on the insects of uh, Southern Africa. And it's written by my major professor, Clark Skoltz and et al. And uh, it has 1600 images. For me, it was like old home week. I was seeing a lot of very familiar chitinous faces, uh, having been a student there for three years. And uh, it's, it's very well done and it's organized by ecological region, which is very interesting. Most of the books that I come across are systematically oriented. And um, this is done in a completely different way. And it's, uh, it's very well done. It's very hard to get a hold of. It takes a long time, but uh, it's well worth it if you have an interest in, in the insects of Southern Africa. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. It's a lot of new stuff. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now I will we'll turn it over to our program chair, Alan Norbaum, who will introduce our featured speaker tonight. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, just to follow up to uh, Tina's comment, um, Yvonne Linton is going to be one of our speakers in the spring. Um, so anyway, tonight, uh, well, uh, before we get started, I um, just want to remind everybody, if you have uh, questions at the end of the, um, of the presentation, please um, use the raise hand feature. If you go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen where it says reactions, you click on that, there's a a place where you can raise your hand. And then um, your, your box will move like to the front, to the top of the list. So we'll, we'll see your, uh, that you have a question or, or a comment. Um, but anyway, for now, I have the um, pleasure to introduce Dr. Jessica Ware, who's patiently sat through this, uh, um, all the business we've had tonight. <laughs> Um, she's an associate curator in invertebrate zoology at the American Museum of Natural History. Her research focuses on the evolution of behavioral and physiological adaptations in insects, with an emphasis on how these occur in Odonata and Dictyoptera. She holds a BS from the University of British Columbia and a PhD from Rutgers University. Uh, Dr. Ware is the past president of the Worldwide Dragonfly Association and serves as current president of the Entomological Society of America. She was recently awarded a PCASE medal from the US government for her work on insect evolution. And so um, with no further ado, please uh, take it away, Jessica. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my slides here. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Uh, I didn't think it was a boring meeting. I actually really enjoyed sitting through that. It was hard not to want to vote for that great slate of new officers, um, but I didn't vote because I'm not a member. Uh, but maybe I should become a member with the form. Um, so uh, as was mentioned, I mostly focused my research program on uh, Gladodea, which are the termites and cockroaches, um, and on Odonata. And I'm going to talk to you today really just about the Odonates, about dragonflies and damselflies, and actually really mostly just about dragonflies. Um, so I'm going to kind of give an overview of what this the state is of what we know for Odonata phylogenetics, um, and then briefly talk about dispersal and migration um, for a couple of species that I'm interested in. Um, and then lastly, I thought I would just mention some of the work that we've done um, in our efforts to try and diversify the field of entomology. Um, so the main questions that I've been posing in my lab have been um, largely related to, you know, how uh, insect groups are related to each other, and then the age of when certain diversification events occurred. Um, and ultimately, we want to try and figure out what some of the drivers are of diversity um, across the insect groups that we study. Um, so this is a just kind of a zoomed in close up of one of the phylogenies that colleagues and I reconstructed using transcriptomes. Um, and we 
routinely find uh, dragonflies and mayflies as close sisters, um, although not always as sisters, but as close relatives uh, near the base of the pterygoda um, or the winged insects. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think we're also fascinated to study odonates is because, um, you know, they were probably something odonate-like that was the first to fly. They have aquatic nymphs, they're voracious predators, their vision is very interesting, they have global distribution, some of them migrate, some of them don't travel far from the pond from which they, they emerged. Um, their color is of interest to a lot of people, um, and they're really ancient. Um, and so for those of you who aren't as familiar with this particular order, uh, it's a relatively small one, although it has more you know, species than mammals. Um, but there's around 3,000 species of dragonflies and around 3,000 species of damselflies, um, the Anisoptera and the Zygoptera, respectively. Um, and then there's a third suborder called Anisozygoptera, which exists today as a single um, genus, Epiophlebia, which is found in China, the Himalayas, and Japan. And when we look uh, kind of across Odonata, what we see, just as when you look across insects, you know, is extreme variation or heterogeneity in size, shape, color, um, and behavior. Uh, the nymphs are all freshwater. Um, so females will overposit their eggs in freshwater and the nymphs develop. They have a labial mass, this is a photo from my colleague, um, Sebastian Busa, that kind of shoots outward to grab um, prey items. Uh, they can take vertebrates, um, you know, tadpoles and minnows uh, as when they're in the juvenile stage, but they also routinely eat each other as well as the nymphs of other aquatic insects. So we've been really focused on kind of unraveling the evolutionary history of odonates. Um, and my colleagues and I have a new grant um, that really aims to kind of test two hypotheses of, of some of the things that may have been driving um, the speciation that we see. Uh, one is color and the other is dispersal capability. So, so there are famous examples of dragonflies, one of which I'll talk about later, that have really long distance migration, but then there are others that travel maybe 11 meters their entire life. Um, and what we've noticed, uh, my colleague uh, who's on this grant with me, uh, Seth Bybee, in his lab has spent a lot of time working on color. Um, and in our lab, we've spent a lot of time looking at wing shape and wing venation. And what we noticed is that in terms of color, the groups that um, are the most colorful when you measure kind of chromaticity and, and different um, spectra of color um, are also the most species rich. Um, and when we look, we can do, uh, we've developed an AI software, which I'll talk about in just a moment, that extracts features of wings. Um, and we noticed that um, certain styles of flight um, seem to, um, or the more variety of styles of flight that uh, families have, those families tend to be uh, the most species rich. And we can predict um, flight behavior style based on wing shape and form. Um, previously, we've done some work looking at habitat and how habitat influences diversification rate. Uh, this is a phylogeny that I reconstructed with my colleague, Harold Lech, um, and his student, Bridget Griswold. Um, but basically what we found was that um, as dragonfly families kind of move from low tick to land tick habitats, um, we see uh, you know, shifts in, in diversification rate. We also have some hypotheses in the literature that suggest that perhaps, perhaps egg laying strategy um, influences um, uh, speciation rate. Um, and there's a lot of interesting questions with male secondary um, penis because males have two penises and their secondary genitalia um, has a lot of interesting um, characteristics to it that use for sperm displacement. And in general, when we look at, when we think about Odonata systematics, what we've noticed is that, with a few exceptions, um, you know, many of the of the definitions that had been defined in the early 20th century weren't necessarily supported with molecular data. Many of the um, studies really focused heavily on wing venation, and although wing venation um, does have some good signal for distinguishing um, at certain taxonomic levels, um, there are some patterns of wing venation that are really more correlated with flight behavior and are not a good reflection of evolutionary history. It turns out. You know, having very dense wing venation can impart a stiffer wing, and having sparser wing venation can make um, a wing a bit more bendy and flexible. And so there are some features of the wing that previously were used for systematics that we now think are probably not a good reflection of, of evolutionary history. So what that means is that um, 
there's a lot of, it's kind of like a renaissance. There's a lot of work going on, kind of redefining the taxonomy of particular groups. Um, Zygopter is, a, is one, um, that suborder really has a lot of work. You know, Rosser and others are kind of working um, to really revise and, and, and refine the taxonomy within this suborder. We really don't even know how many families are in this um, suborder because there's a lot of debate. Some people think that there's 50, some people think there's 20, um, and people feel um, kind of passionately about these numbers, <laughs> to say the least. So there's a lot of work to be done um, for for zygoptrin systematics. And as Rosser mentioned, we you know we we co-authored a paper kind of revising the senlicity. Um, but in general, most of the work that um, we've been focused on in my lab have been on the other suborder, Anisoptera, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So the Anisoptera have but ten families. Um, and although there's a, a, you know, a smaller number of families, there is still some chaos. So the relative position of the gomphidae, which I've kind of, or gomphidia, uh, I've kind of colored with this green square, the pedalaridae or pedalaroidea, uh, which I've colored with this purple square, and the superfamily libelluloidea, which I've colored um, with these, there's four or so families, which I've shown here, which I've colored with these blue squares, the relative position of these dragonfly families has been debated. Um, and pretty much any phylogeny that someone makes seems to disagree. Um, the gomphidae are interesting. These are the club tails. Um, and they're called this because males have this kind of expanded cuticular uh, region at the tip of their, um, at the tip of their abdomen. Um, and there's over a thousand species. Uh, the superfamily Libelloidea, over 1,600 species. So there's really, these are really where like a lot of the richness of, of species um, exists within Anisoptera. By contrast, the Pedalaroidea or Pedalaridae, um, they have but 10 species and they're kind of famous. The Smithsonian actually has this thesis um, in entomology, but there was a, someone who did their thesis on this uh, group in the 1970s, Perry Turner. Um, and he uh, suggested that perhaps, uh, you know, there's, there's very few Pedalarids and they're rare in the habitat and they're the primary diet of Sasquatch. And so Sasquatch is rare because this food source is rare. Um, you can take with that, from that what you will. So what we did with colleagues was we used targeted enrichment, which is a method where we were able to kind of quickly extract um, you know, DNA and amplify close to 500 genes or 500 loci. Um, and we did this for a sampling of taxa across the Odonata um, so that we could try and you know, reconstruct a robust and comprehensive phylogeny. Um, we did find some surprises. So within Zygoptera, we recovered a paraphyletic collapse this is a superfamily that includes things like the American ruby spot, which is beloved by ecologists. Many people have worked on this because the size of the red spot kind of indicates males' ability to hold a territory, um, as well as, you know, beautiful things like Coleopteryx, which are well known and beloved. Um, but we're still finding out, um, you know, some new things about them that, you know, for example, the paraphyly of this group. Um, that other suborder that I mentioned, the Anisozygoptera, the one that only exists as that single genus, we recovered as sister to the Anisoptera. Um, uh, and that has been found many, many times. Maybe at some point someone will, will merge those two together. So one of the questions that I've always wanted to answer um, was whether or not egg laying behavior um, uh, you know, whether egg laying behavior was related to this really high species richness that we see within Gomphidae and within Libelluloidea. So there's two, a couple of different ways that odonates lay their eggs. Um, all damselflies and some of the dragonfly families, um, females have an ovipositor or an egg laying apparatus, um, and she oviposits endophytically within plants. Um, but but there's these two groups, the Libelloidea and the Gomphidae, and instead they have a reduced or vestigial ovipositor. They squirt out their eggs in kind of a clump like this. Um, it's exophytic because it's not within plant material, um, and it's much faster way of laying their eggs. Um, and we wondered what the ancestral egg laying strategy is. So this is what it looks like when a female is just kind of doing that exophytic oviposition without an ovipositor. She just kind of taps her abdomen on the surface of the water and the eggs are dispersed in the water column. 
Uh, sometimes you can see this, um, these dragonflies actually will also do this sometimes on the surface of your car because they can't distinguish um, you know, the surface of your car from the surface of water. Um, Camilla Koch and others suggest have, have done work kind of timing um, these oviposition events. Um, and you know, endophytic oviposition is much more time consuming. Plus individuals are kind of constrained by the finite size of whatever plant material they're laying their eggs in. Uh, Exophytic oviposition is much faster, which she argued um, and others have argued that perhaps um, is, is advantageous uh, because while females are overpositing, um, you know, they're constantly have these threats of predation from fish and birds and frogs and, and lizards and what have you. Um, plus freed from having to lay their eggs within the confines of plant material, they can have larger clutch sizes. But in order for us to really understand what the ancestral egg laying strategy is, um, we need to have a robust phylogeny. So if Gomphidae and Libelluloidea are sister taxa, that suggests that they lost the ovipositor just once. Um, but if the Pedalaridae, which are the Sasquatch food, are recovered as sister to the Gomphids, um, that would mean that the reduction in the ovipositor occurred twice. Uh, so if we look at this phylogeny that we made with, again, close to 500 loci, um, and we zoom in here, what we find is that the, the pedalarity or the Sasquatch food is recovered as sister to the gomphids. Uh, we find this with strong bootstrap support, strong posterior probability, strong um, metrics, other types of metrics that you can use to e estimate support like quartet sampling. Um, so again, this is suggesting that this reduction in the ovipositor, the you know switch to just tapping your abdomen on the surface of the water, it seems to have evolved twice. Um, we can look at different types of data to see whether or not we find congruence. So this is a phylogeny that um, colleagues and I just got accepted this year. It's led by my postdoc, Manpreet Kohli. In the last phylogeny I showed you had around 500 genes um, or a little less than 500 genes. This has close to 3000 uh, protein coding genes. So a lot more data, similar taxon sampling, although not identical. Um, and we find the same result. So again, we find the pedalarity or Sasquatch food as sister to the gomphidae, again, suggesting that the reduction in the ovipositor occurred twice. Um, so I've kind of been really focused my entire, well, I guess I've had graduate students that worked on, on damselflies before, um, but I've really focused my entire research program or what with the projects that I've worked on mostly on this part of the Odonata tree of life um, on the Anisoptera. And in particular, I've been really interested in the Libelluloidea. Um, and one of the things that has been puzzling within this superfamily is the relative position of these different types of emeralds or um, synthemicity and cordiality. Synthemicities are sometimes called southern emeralds, sometimes they're called tiger tails. Um, they have at times been, you know, 13 families, sometimes they've been one family, sometimes they've been two or more families. Um, there really has been a lot of chaos and a lack of resolution uh, for these relative, um, the relative position of these, these really charismatic, beautiful, often metallic um, dragonflies with bright green eyes. Um, part of the reason why the cordyliids and the synthemicids have been really confusing to taxonomists is in part because many of the characteristics that we use to define, uh, that were used to define these families um, are kind of blurry. Um, so we often think of the anal loop in dragonflies as being very well defined in cordyliids. Uh, they have like thing that almost looks like a horse's hoof, um, but not so in synthemicids. Um, they have kind of like a sausage or an amorphous shape um, that is, and they tend to have a reduction in the anal veins of their wing. Um, and in the, also some of the nymph, some of the females have a secondarily elongate ovipositor. So they actually have an ovipositor of sorts. It's a secondary, secondarily derived one. So in general, there's just been a lot of confusion about how to treat these characters. Um, I was always kind of interested in, you know, uh, doing deep sampling um, to really kind of for once and for all answer this question of whether or not synthemicids and cordyliids could be, whether they were two separate groups or whether they could be well-defined. So for part of my thesis work, like years and years ago, I did a lot of taxon sampling within the synthemicity and the cordyliidae. This was just with Sanger sequencing data. Um, and I did recover those as two separate monophyletic groups. Um, subsequent studies haven't always found this, although they've usually only had one or two synthemistids included. Um, so uh, 
the Cordiuliani at the time, which was what was called, now we call them Cordiuliids, um, that does seem to include a lot of the North American favorites that we know and love, <laughs> just from, you know, DC, from New Jersey. Um, and my graduate student, Aaron Goodman, is, is also interested in this question. And so he's doing, as part of his thesis work, a project that is sampling with 500 loci, um, you know, all of the synthomistids, all of the cordyliids, um, so that he can maybe hopefully for once and for all really kind of define what these two um, families are. So within the cordyliidae, there is this genus, Neurocordulia. And when I was in graduate school, I said to my advisor, man, I really want to work on Neurocordulia. And Mike May was kind of like, you know, why would you want to do that? That's a really boring genus and nobody works on it because there's really nothing, there's no story there. You look know, like, kid, if you want to make it, you shouldn't put your eggs into this basket. Um, and so I kind of put neurocordulia on the side um, until recently. Uh, and then I thought, you know what? What's the point of being a tenured uh, you know, scientist if you can't take your time and use it for something that you're curious about? And so I thought I would just take a quick little foray and tell you something about the neurocordulia um, because they have a fascinating life history uh, strategy. So there's seven species within Neurocordulia. Um, they exist mostly in, um, you know, Canada and the United States in the eastern part of Canada and the United States. Um, only three of them have been sequenced for any molecular data, and this was mostly during my thesis work and some work that um, Seth Bybee did. Um, so most of them have only been treated with morphological data. Um, they look like this. So they're emeralds, but they don't have green eyes. They're actually drab and brown in color. They're not the classic colorful dragonfly that you might think of when you think of dragonflies. Um, uh, and it's because in part they fly crepuscular. So they have a crepuscular time period when they fly. So they, if it's warm enough, they'll fly in at dawn, but usually you find them flying at night when it's too dark to read a newspaper. Um, and it's usually for 15 to 30 minutes in total. And they spend the rest of their time kind of perched um, on the banks of low tick habitats. Um, so you often find them along large rivers um, or along the shores of lakes. Um, and when they fly, they tend to fly out over open water with erratic, fast flight, with changes rapidly in the height of the air column um, where, where they're flying. So when you ask people, have you ever collected neurocordulia? Almost invariably, a neonatologist will say, oh yeah, I almost died. You know, because every story that goes along with this dragonfly usually involves peril um, or, you know, some type of danger because you're, you're usually sampling at night, it's hard to see them, they're flying quickly, and you're usually out over open water. Um, in terms of what we know about their kind of conservation status, the IUCN lists um, them as being stable, except for two species for which they don't have enough, in, they don't have, they're data deficient. Um, Michael I is the species that was most recently described. But if we look um, kind of like on a province by province or a state by state basis, what we see is actually that the ranges of these species, this is an example of a map for Yamaskinensis, are actually contracting. So in parts of their range, they're going locally um, extinct. So it's a group that we probably should be paying some attention to. Um, and so I wanted to know, you know, this is, why not? Why not spend some time working on neurocordulia? Uh, and I was curious about how big neurocordulia populations are. You rarely see them, but when you see them, you usually see a few of them. And so I wasn't sure if the reason why they're uncommonly collected was just maybe because of, you know, the fact that you're doing it at night um, and it seems kind of, kind of dangerous. Um, I asked some colleagues at different Different institutions, um, how many individuals uh, they had in their collections. Smithsonian has 131. We have five before my study started at the American Museum. I asked Bill Moffrey at the Florida State Collection of Arthropods, which has the largest collection of, of odonates um, at the museum, and they have 500. Um, and he said, someone should come and work on those. So um, that's exciting. Um, James Needham said uh, in his book, Dragonflies of North America, the dainty adults fly on, oh, fly on silent wings in the twilight. Um, and they are not so common in set collections as their abundance in nature warrants. They're impo nearly impossible to see in the dimness of the shadow. Uh, man, he is correct on that one. And I'll tell you uh, more about that in just a moment. So imagine my surprise. Uh, I go to Canada pretty often. I'm from Canada uh, and I go to this part of Ontario, which technically is considered Northern Ontario since it's far enough from the US border. 
Um, and this is what it looks like now. Uh, and this is what it looks like in the summer. There's my kiddo kind of swimming there. Um, and my granddad built this boathouse. This is where my Nana and granddad live. Uh, my he had passed away, but he built a dock that kind of jets out into this lake. Um, and imagine my surprise when I don't usually spend a lot of time down at the dock at night because uh, the mosquitoes are bad, but in standing out in the dock at late at night, there were shadow dragons. So the great thing about that dock kind of being built out, jetting into this open part of the lake, they tend to fly over open parts of the lake. So usually you have to collect them with hip waders or in a canoe because um, they don't, or they're not often right at the shore. Um, but with this, with this dock kind of jetting out into the lake, we, we had this unprecedented access, at least for, in my collecting experience, to shadow dragons. Um, so I enlisted the help of family and friends to spend time out at night. Um, uh, to collect, and I thought we could ask this question for the species that's there, Yamaskinensis, how big is the population of Neurocodulia Yamaskinensis on Lake Muskoka? Um, so we thought we would do a classic mark recapture study just to get some preliminary data, write some Sharpie numbers on individuals, release them and recapture them, and then we could freeze them to do some DNA work. Well, it turns out that was a really big challenge because um, there's so few of them that come out any night and they're only out for 15 to 30 minutes maximum. So we sampled um, for their entire flight period, of, which is the month of July in this part of Ontario, um, in 2018 and in 2019. Um, and uh, we were able to collect quite, quite a few individuals, um, but we had, we got eaten by a lot of mosquitoes, I can tell you that right now. And uh, one of my field notes noted that the kids complained. So I, I did enlist some family help and boy, what a lot of belly aching um, collecting dragonflies at night. There were very few people that enjoyed it um, in my, I enjoyed it, but they didn't enjoy it. What we noticed is that they usually would come out at 9.01 um, and then by 9.20, all of the individuals um, had gone back to roost. Um, so we weren't actually able to do very much with the data that we collected. We ended up marking a total of 50 each summer. Um, uh, that was the maximum that we got. Um, and we recaught a total of four. This is the data for 2019 across the entire season. So we obviously hadn't saturated, you know, with our marking technique. We were able to use this time to make other observations, you know, their tandem over position. We never saw um, less than five individuals a night, but we never saw more than 10. So these are like small numbers, again, really short period of time. We had this idea that in 2020, we would mark um, individuals with kind of this glow in the dark powder, powder so we could see where their roosting sites were, but we haven't been able to go back and doing any sampling uh, because of COVID. So with the specimens that we did collect, we were able to sequence. Um, this is a phylogeny based on 650,000 nucleotide sites from SNP data. Um, this, the closest relative uh, to Yamaskinensis is Michaeli. Um, this was a sample that we had from Maine and a couple samples um, that Mike May almost died collecting in Arne Prior, Ontario. Um, and this is the Yamaskinensis that we collected at my nan's house. Um, we Called it, or we're calling it Yamaskinensis question mark because there actually are some features of these dragonflies that we were collecting in this site uh, that are slightly different than, from what the literature would suggest for Yamaskinensis. Something slightly different with the tibial keel, some of the venation pattern is slightly different, but we don't really know enough uh, for many dragonfly species, but certainly not for shadow dragons, about the variability of some of these morphological characters for a species. Um, this is what a haplotype network looked like of our data. In this haplotype, each circle indicates a genetic pattern, and the size of the circle indicates the number of individuals that share that genetic pattern. These tick marks indicate nucleotide differences. So, of course, there's lots of differences between the, the two different species, Michaeli and Yamaskinensis. It turns out that one of the individuals that we had um, actually did have the morphological characteristics that you would say would be a classic Neurocodulia Yamaskinensis, and that's this one. Um, and then these other individuals, all of the other individuals were Yamaskinensis question mark, um, and they had these three main haplotypes. So we have some plans um, uh, as for this kind of fun side project to do some more sampling at other parts of this area of Ontario on different lakes um, and to start doing 5X whole genome sequencing um, instead of SNPs, uh, as well as we have a genome of Neurocordulia. We started with an Illumina genome, uh, but we switched to doing an additional genome with PacBio so that we could ask some questions about vision and about color because for these two, um, features for this night flying dragonfly, that would be really interesting. 
And we're doing a genus level revision using morphology of nymphs and adults, as well as sampling for all seven species um, using uh, you know, the, our, lo our locus data set using targeted enrichment. So that's just, I mean, I chose to do neurocordulia because I've always just been kind of fascinated by this kind of gothic night flying dragonfly. Um, and uh, we know a tiny, we just barely scratching the surface of what we know about this, this species. Um, and in general, we kind of lack this population data, this level of population data for most of the species of odonates with a couple of exceptions. So one that we know a little bit more about is this. Uh, this is a photo that Greg Lassley took of Pentella flavescens. We know a little bit more about it because it's a migratory dragonfly. Its common name is the global wanderer or the wandering glider. Um, this is a cartoon that Sasha Sayroy uh, drew last year. Uh, just kind of exemplifying like what they do. They're frequent flyers. No matter where you go, you pretty much um, are guaranteed that you'll find Pantella unless you're in Antarctica and in the very, very northern uh, part of the globe. So there's two species in this genus, Pantella flavescens, which is the cosmopolitan one, and Hymenia, which uh, exists in the um, western hemisphere um, from Canada to Argentina. Um, they have really rapid larval development or nymphal development. They develop within five to six weeks and they take advantage of temporary and transient bodies of water. So they usually follow these rainy seasons. Um, and that, so of course their individual, their, their nymphs need to develop in a, in a rapid amount of time. We've tried rearing these in the lab. These are some photos that my former graduate student Nene Agba took of the, of the eggs. Um, they have some morphological features that make that some have suggested facilitate kind of semi-passive dispersal. So they take advantage of winds that go around the equator, the intertropical convergence zone. Um, and they have an expanded region here, which I've colored with red, uh, which is where their anal veins are, um, that some have suggested perhaps increased surface area decreases energy expenditure for this kind of gliding style flight that they do. Um, but colleagues who sampled um, remote islands in the South Pacific uh, suggested that in, in the late 20th century, uh, you know, 1970s, 1980s, um, they made observations that said that they had different behavior than these island populations of Pantella had different behavior than mainland or continental populations. Um, most Pantella, when wind passes over the surface of their wings, they pick up their tarsi to get carried by wind. But on Easter Island, for example, they were found to crouch when wind passed over their, their wings. And some suggested that perhaps this was to avoid being blown out to sea. Um, salt water is death. Um, and these long distance migrations that they do, it's in many ways a suicide mission, not all of the individuals actually make it across the oceans. So we wanted to ask uh, the question about what a Palantella population is, if it is really globally distributed. Um, so we took samples of Pantella from the countries that are shown here that I've color coded on this map. And again, these are haplotype networks um, that kind of represent the different patterns that we found. Each circle is a genetic pattern and the size of the circle indicates the number of individuals that share that pattern. And I've color coded it based on what country those individuals came from. So you can see that no matter whether you're looking at the hemisphere level, continent level, or the country level, there's one main genetic pattern that almost all Pantella share no matter where we collected them from. Um, and the few individual variants that we saw were usually one or two nucleotides different. When we look at other measures um, for population statistics, we find that there's high levels of gene flow um, and uh, very low population st structure suggesting kind of global panmixia. Um, so one of the questions that we wanted to ask was, was this real or was this just an artifact of the genetic marker that we used to do that study? Um, so with colleagues, um, we did an isotope analysis. So dragonflies develop in freshwater, like I mentioned, and the nymphs actually have the adult wings develop while they're in freshwater. So the components of the adult wings, um, like the hydrogen in the adult wings, actually comes from the water, the H2O, in the water from which the nymphs were developing. Hydrogen varies in its weight on a longitudinal and latitudinal gradient. So you can actually cut the wings off of a dragonfly and combust them and measure the weight of hydrogen. And that will tell you whether or not the individual that you collected, say in Guyana, whether or not that individual had emerged from water in Guyana or whether it emerged in, from water in Nigeria or in, in Australia or in Northern Ontario or wherever. Um, so you can get these kind of heat maps that show the predicted hydrogen weight for a given region. And then you can compare that to the weights of hydrogen in the wings of the dragonflies that you burnt. 
Um, so this is an example of what some of the data look like. Um, what we found is that the majority of individuals that we, uh, we didn't combust all 770 uh, individuals that we had genetic information for because it is a destructive sampling. You have to burn the wings. Um, we did a subsample from the countries that are listed here, um, and we found that the majority of them were migrants. And the few individuals from the Andes uh, from the Peru samples, for example, that we had um, that didn't show, that showed kind of like a resident signature there, the hydrogen was predicted for the hydrogen, um, the, uh, hydrogen weights that you would find in the Andes. Um, those were actually museum specimens um, and they were tenoral. They had been tenoral wings. The wings are very shiny, suggesting that those had just emerged. So we actually wanna kind of extend this across seasons to see whether or not we would still find the same patterns for the Andes. Um, our call, the same colleagues that did work in the um, islands suggested um, that in remote islands, perhaps the wing sizes and shapes of Pantala were different than what they had seen in continent, um, continental populations of Pantala. And so my graduate student, Salkatua uh, Mafla Mills, has actually been scanning wings using this automatic, this AI technology that we developed, um, which I'll mention about in just a moment, um, so that she could actually see whether or not islands and mainland um, populations of Pantala differ in their wings size and shape. So just to kind of sum up that kind of fast uh, speed through of what we are working on, um, you know, we've uh, been working on trying to just slowly go through and systematically revise um, kind of the family level um, taxonomy, um, as well as kind of do these ordinal level phylogeny so that we could test questions about diversification and the evolutionary history of these groups. So I mentioned that one of the things we wanted to find out about was color, uh, the influence of color and dispersal ability um, on, um, on odonata diversification. Um, and so this is a really big focus of the work that we're doing in our grant, which we call GEOD for Genealogy and Ecology of Odonata. Um, we also are developing as part of this grant um, geographic range maps for all of the species of odonata, um, as well as collecting molecular data for as many, as close to the 6,000 or so species as possible. We also are scanning um, wings for all of the, the species of odonate so that there'll be a morphological data set, um, body morphology um, of adults, as well as wing morphology. We're not doing nymphal characters just because it was kind of beyond what we could do in the scope of a three-year grant. Um, and to collect this wing information, we're using uh, this AI technology that we developed, which is called Odomatic because it automatically gets wing features from Odonata. So that's what the name is. And it's also, we, the, we to sound cool, we gave it an acronym. So it's, we call it TOAD, because it's the Targeted Odonata Wing Database. Um, it's a great tool because it also scans the card information. Um, and so it is a way to also digitize um, a collection, because then you can scrape this card information um, to digitize your Odonata. And it gives you um, chromaticity values as well. So we wanted to know whether or not we'd be able to use the museum specimens that we have um, to do some of the sequencing that we wanted to do for this 500 locus data set. Um, so we did a test to see whether or not, like what's the oldest odonata that we'd be able to get uh, good workable DNA from? And I mentioned before, people, um, one of the things that you think of when you think of odonata is color. Um, and Odonatologists have really tried very hard, certainly in the last 40 years, to preserve the color in odonate. So if you look at older specimens in museums, they tend to all kind of look like that neurocordulia. Like they're kind of dull, drab, brown in color. Um, but starting in the 1960s, um, people really started trying to experiment with all different things uh, that they submerged uh, their dragonflies in to try and preserve the color. Um, so we, we kind of asked a bunch of colleagues, what, when did you start using this? When did you start using that? Um, and we got a lot of kind of remarkable answers of different things that people had tried. Um, and we started getting worried that perhaps some of this would affect whether it would affect the quality of the DNA. Eventually we've, you know, odontology has settled on using acetone as a preservation method, um, which actually does preserve DNA very well. Um, so we did this test where we took samples. The oldest sample that we had was from 1909. Um, and we tried to sample as many old, 
old taxa as we could, um, old specimens as we could. Um, and we did this both with the American Museum and Naturalist Collections. Um, and we looked at, at an expedition by expedition. So, you know, um, my colleague Vincent Kaufman took Mueller um, uh, expedition samples and I took Mueller expedition samples from the AMNH to also see because the museums had, had different climate control and different uh, histories. Anyways, um, we were able to get DNA from everything. So some samples are more, some samples had higher um, number of loci that ended up amplifying than others, but we got DNA from everything. We were able to sample at least 20, you know, 20 loci for all of the things that we tried, including the sample from 1909. So this gives us some kind of excitement because we know that there's usable DNA. Um, and it also hopefully will kind of open the doors to be able to collaborate with others because there were some of our colleagues in other countries that were worried that their specimens maybe wouldn't be viable, but this gives us some hope that probably everything will work. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about this project, um, we have a website uh, and you can uh, reach out to us because we really want to collaborate with everybody, um, which is a good segue uh, to the last point which I wanted to make, which was that we should all be collaborating. I mean, if anything, working on Odinata, um, uh, you know, what I've noticed is that the Odinate community is very, very collaborative and in general entomology is very, very collaborative, but there just are not enough of us to do all the work uh, when there's so many species. Um, so it's surprising to me that there still exists some barriers to participation when we, ought, we clearly need more humans uh, if we're gonna get the entomology work done. Um, so to kind of hopefully um, diverse, help to diversify the field, some colleagues and I started a collective last year. Uh, we call it Entomologists of Color, or EntoPOC for short. We have a website, which you can find here. Um, but the goals of this group is really to recruit and retain a diverse um, group of, uh, a, a diversity of, of entomologists, as well as to do advocacy work to try and break down some systemic barriers to participation. Um, so one of the things that we did was a fundraising campaign, um, and we raised funds to pay for free memberships uh, for to students of color, um, up to three memberships per student. If you go to our website, there are these different drop down menus. If they can't find a society that they want to belong to, any society in the world, they can just email us and let us know. Um, and then we, as part of this visibility campaign, um, we feature these these students that receive these memberships on our social media. Um, so this way it can kind of change people's perceptions perhaps of what they think of when they picture a scientist, but also it gives exposure to these students and these students are able to be contacted um, for potential jobs and they've, we've had media people contact them and I think they've really gotten a lot of exposure through this. Um, we've given away over 350 memberships so far. Um, and we've also participated in a couple of initiatives uh, that really aim to do kind of a cell celebration of the work that's being done by particular groups. Uh, so we worked with uh, the Black and Natural History Museums, uh, which had a week earlier this year uh, in November, in end of October. Um, and we also uh, worked with the Black and Entomology Group um, to create contact with content, which is available on their YouTube, a YouTube um, playlist that you can view at your leisure. Uh, things about entomophagy, about colonialism in, in entomology and what have you. So some topics are were kind of heavy um, and some topics were, were more lighthearted, like how to cook cricket mac and cheese and, and things like that. Ultimately, the goal of doing these initiatives is to kind of capture the capture people and keep them in entomology. These are some photos of my kids when they were younger, they're teenagers now, uh, but just like me, they had that kind of innate curiosity in the natural world. They wanted to participate. Um, and the hope is that there will be an entomology where everyone can participate um, and uh, we can get this work done because there's a lot of descriptions to be done. There's a lot of revisions to be done um, and there's always strength in numbers. So with that, I'll thank my uh, colleagues and collaborators and funders. I'd like to thank the research team with which I work in my lab, my graduate students and postdoc and museum specialist, um, as well as my former graduate students and, um, and postdocs. And if there's time, I know this is a bit of a long meeting already, uh, I'll take any questions. <laughs> Cal? Do I, I just call them out? Al? I, 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 um, I was glad that you uh -huh. talked about uh, neurocordulia because that's one of my favorite uh, experiences catching neurocordulia. 
uh, any of the people in the Washington area, I, I, they, they're around here as well. And I know that uh, I and other uh, friends go out to Susquehanna River usually in June or July and have a, a good night uh, wading up to our waist and uh, swinging at the things that we can't catch most of the time. Anyway, what I was wondering is, I didn't see on your list, and maybe it was there and I didn't see it, but where does William Sonia fit in here? Because in its original descriptions, it was Dora Cordulia, and another time it was uh, uh, Hilo Cordulia, and I was wondering where does it fit in? Yeah, we haven't we haven't sampled it yet for for molecular data. So I mean, I guess we'll we'll see in this revision um, where it, where it falls. I mean, uh -huh. um, we've I Ken Tennyson sent me a couple of uh, legs, um, so I have both. I have I think both species. Um, <clears throat> But uh, so, I mean, they'll be in there, uh, you know, they'll be in this phylogeny, but I don't know that anyone's ever treated it with, with, with molecules and with morphology. I mean, it's somewhere within that hodgepodge that is cordiality. It's definitely not close to the synthesis, I don't think based on, on, I've looked at nymphs and I've looked at adults, but, um, but I think having this comprehensive data set will hopefully answer it. We're, the, Aaron Goodman is the student that's kind of doing this for his thesis work for this section of the tree. Um, and he's gonna sample every single, including like every single macromeity, synthemicity and cordiality. So that whole section will be hopefully really filled in. Good, thank you. I had a question. Um, can the system you use, the AI system for you know, looking at the wing venation work for other insects? Um, it can, yeah, absolutely. So it uses like an, it uses, um, um, basically it, it uses an, it's a neural network uh, uh, and you have to train it on a data set. So we've trained it on Odonata, but you could take the same code and train it really on anything. So we had colleagues um, when I was, I used as a professor at Rutgers Newark before coming um, to the AMH and, and there was a colleague that was working on cells um, and he was able to train it to to recognize cells on a on a slide and be able to count cells. Um, so you, you just have to provide it with a training data set. Um, we trained it on, I think, 500 or 600 um, species. Um, and then once we had trained it on that, it was able to be used for our Odinetta. So it doesn't, the you do have to build the training data set, but after that, the data is very, very quickly acquired. So it takes about three seconds um, to uh, give you, you know, all of the features, the so length, width, area, specific, the position of specific veins, um, uh, number of antinodals, uh, which is a big thing for odinates, uh, position of pterostigma, which is another big thing for odinates. But even if you just wanted like length, width, shape, um, it's, it's, it's pretty fast once you have your training data set. I'd be happy to, to uh, point you in, in the direction of the GitHub and the code if that would be helpful. Sure, if you, if you can put it in the chat, that would be nice. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. I will say as an aside, this past summer we had an REU student and we thought it would be neat to have them try fossils. Um, so fossil, there's lots of fossil odinates that actually can be placed in the, gen the genus of extant taxa, um, as well as things that are, you know, fam fossil families that, are ex that exist only as, as extinct lineages. And so we scanned um, some uh, fossils as well as we scanned, you know, the, the drawings that people have in their, their descriptions of fossils. And boy, it can't do that. It can't do those. <laughs> it needs to be trained on fossils. So because it's only been trained on extant taxa, it really was flummoxed um, by some of the extinct uh, fossils. It really just did not know what they were. <laughs> Jessica, this is uh, this is Alan. Um, given that you, you know, did your uh, doctoral or no, your 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 um, bachelor's in, in British Columbia, did you personally try to test the Sasquatch hypothesis? <laughs> it's a good question. So we've done a lot of work on pedalarity. Uh, I didn't do it when I was in British Columbia, but we, we, we published some work on, on pedalarity. It's a few papers and we actually are doing, um, uh, so the genus that is, it's Tenipteryx is the genus that's in uh, the West Coast where Sasquatch is, the one that's the one that Perry Turner thought that they were eating. Um, 
And so we were doing a PAC bio hi-fi genome of this. One of my graduate students is working on this as part of his thesis work, as well as we're doing population genetic sampling of, of Tenifteryx. Also Feeney's in Europe, Atala, and a, a few of the members of this family. So we, I feel like we've, to do that sampling, we've, you know, we or our collaborators have done a lot of, we put a lot of time in where that, where the Sasquatch would be and we haven't seen it. So I'm starting to think that's, Maybe that's so fun. I don't know. We should go to a cryptozoology conference and tell them, like, look, the food source is abundant. So uh, what we did find from doing our tenipteric sampling is that um, it's true that it's not common. Their, their populations are patchy, but when you find them, they were there in, in hundreds and hundreds. So, um, you know, Sasquatch could eat those. My goodness. <laughs> um, early on, you, you mentioned that uh, you saw like a correlation between habitat and, and I guess diversity. You, you mentioned, uh, I guess, you have more diversity in, in lentic habitats. Is that correct? Well, what we saw was shifts in diversification rate as, um, individ as lineages moved from lotic to lentic habitats. So it did seem like um, more in that direction than, than in the other direction. In dragonflies, uh, you know, you see a lot of shifts actually. Um, we could have a, a clay that has multiple kind of shifts from lentic to lotic habitats. Um, but we found that the shift from lotic to lentic habitat was led to a significant um, uh, increase in diversification rate kind of across families. Do you think that's because like, that's usually gonna mean higher altitude and so you have more likelihood of vicarious events because of the altitude or, or do you have any idea why? Well, I wondered if it was also, you know, just kind of um, expanded larval niche space. Um, there's a lot of stuff that happens um, in terms of selection with the nymphs as well. Um, so I think that we, I think what we argued in that paper was uh, that we thought that this was, you know, as there was shifts in, in habitat, it allowed, um, slightly different uh, dispersal, because they also disperse in the in the nymph stage. Uh, so, you know, when things went from being river species to being, uh, you know, pond dwelling species, this the dispersal was then largely going to be in the adult stage versus the the nymph, the nymph stage. And so we we argued in that paper that it was kind of these shifts in, in larval and nymphal habitats that maybe was driving that pattern. Although, I mean, so I wrote the paper. I really, I think, I still think that the, um, the conclusions are, are sound, but I do, I will say one caveat is that um, the more we know about diversification rate analyses, the more I wonder if we should ever do them because we often find correlations everywhere, right? I could probably see if, uh, you know, I think the more things you test to see if that's correlated with diversification rate, the more, things you say, yeah, that is correlated. So if everyone- I don't think you're the first one to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've heard that quite a bit, it seems, yeah. Yeah, so take it with a grain of salt when, when I think, you know, we haven't done those analyses very often since then because of that very reason that you do tend to, a lot of things end up being correlated with diversification rate shifts, so. So in the, in the DNA work you did on the, uh, the dry specimens, how much of the insect do you have to sample? Is it just a leg or you have to like somehow extract a bigger portion? So be, it's such a good question. So we wanted, we because we wanted this to be a test of the worst case scenario, we took a sampling of Zygoptera, like the tiniest Zygoptera that we had to the biggest dragonflies. Um, the oldest to like, I think the, the youngest we had was from the sixties or so. And we only used a leg because we wanted to know what would, that's like the bare minimum that people usually would use. So we wanted to do, you know, in the worst case scenario with a really old specimen, if all you had was a leg, what would happen? So for all of those, even the tiny little damselflies, it was just a single leg. Um, and like I said, they all amplified. We extracted the DNA and for some, you have to usually quantify how much DNA you are able to extract from your sample. Um, and you, that's usually what the sequencing company wants to know. Well, for a lot of these, the quantity that it measured was like, like less than one, you know, less, like very, very tiny number of nanograms of, of DNA. 
to the point where it almost seemed like we were taking our wallets and just dumping the money into the garbage. We might as well, because it's expensive to do those things. But we figured, you know, this is the point of the test is to see if maybe DNA yield or quantifying how much DNA is in something, whether that actually really is a good predictor of success for these types of targeted enrichment sequencing methods. And it turns out it's not really a good predictor. So it was a lot of things that showed that it had very low DNA yield, but we still got very good clean um, sequences uh, for you know 20 loci, which for dragonflies, um, you know that usually actually gives quite a lot of resolution. Hmm. So one need not destroy one's samples. One can just take a leg um, and preserve you know the integrity of your specimen, uh, which is a real relief. It just seems like amazingly good results. Like the uh, flies I study, you know, you're lucky if you get maybe 10%, you know, anything over 10 years old. Well, I think the method is part of part of it as well, Ellen. So the targeted yeah. enrichment generally tends to work on older specimens. It usually works better on, on DNA that is fragmented, um, which older specimens are. Uh, and we also kind of, we use like a micro prep um, uh, extraction kit that maybe, I mean, maybe that also kind of can help a little bit with the type of extraction methods that one does, I guess. But the anchored hybrid enrichment is, that's one of the things that's really great about it, I suppose, is that it does tend to work on really old things. Cool. Mm -hmm. We have any other, uh, any other questions? Hi, uh, George Foster here. Jessica, um, I'm giving a presentation in January to a group of high school students just talking about what entomologists do. And I'm a dipterist, so I'm gonna bring a bunch of flies and slides of flies and stuff like that. But uh, I was thinking, trying to think of ways to get them excited. And some of your slides where you showed all these young folks getting involved, um, like entomologists of color and some of those slides. Is it possible that I can get some copies of just those slides to show these kids uh, that there's a lot going on? Sure, yeah, absolutely. And please, I could share this um, with the group. Uh, if you have any students that wanna participate in any of those initiatives, uh, we, we, did the, we had a very successful fundraising campaign. So we have funding to, for registrations for meetings. We have funding for, um, uh, for for you know uh, memberships and, and things like that so please pass them along to who those who you think would be interested okay just making a note to myself <laughs> and a few things. well you can you give us all your email maybe and i can reach out to you and get some information or maybe copies of just those couple of slides sure i just put it in the chat um gotcha. okay i see it thank you <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, um, thank you again so much, uh, Jessica, for um, your time. You must be really busy as uh, ESA president, so we especially appreciate your taking the time to join us tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you to my Dragonfly friends and colleagues for also coming to this meeting and uh it's it's really been a pleasure so thank you yeah it's great seeing you jessica congratulations thank you <laughs> hi warren <laughs> thank you dr weir thank you thanks so much jessica that was awesome thank you okay everybody we've got one more order of business for tonight. Uh, this next section is special for the for the annual meeting. We have the passing ceremonial passing of the gavel. So tonight, uh, Lord is tomorrow takes over as uh, president, I will become past president and Lord is I'm gonna pass the gavel virtually. Hey, point of order that looks like a hammer. <laughs> It's a, it works as a gavel too. Hey, look at that. You all right, it worked. Wow. Oh, power. Excellent. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs>
Oh, it's like a crab. <laughs> that was great. Did you see that? Came through the screen there. That's amazing. Magically. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, great. Yeah, well, this is great. This is a, a great honor uh, to be um, president of the uh, Entomological Society of Washington. And Jamie, you've done a great job as president. I know you've said this multiple times that this took you out of your comfort zone, but um, I think you were just great. And um, you have a, a certain style, but it's, it's a very effective. And, and so thank you very much. And thank you for also your guidance. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, great. So the, the last announcement uh, for the meeting is that our next meeting is January 6th. Again, at 7 p.m. And as is customary, the outgoing president, Jamie Zanizer, uh, will be our featured speaker. And you'll let us know what uh, your full title will be, but it will probably be on your little uh, home terms that you work on, Hemtura. So that'll be exciting. So make sure to join us for that. So um, do I hear a motion to adjourn? <laughs> I think that's how it goes, right? Yeah, so moved. Okay, uh, in a second, I think I saw Matt has raised his hand. And congratulations to Matt for um, being president elect. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Jessica and I uh, go, go back a long way. And so it's great to always see you and catch up with you and seeing what you're doing. So that's wonderful. Okay, so uh, with that, I um, so I think I just bang uh, and then uh, meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>